I would like to welcome my guest today, Andrew Bronwyn of Bronwyn and Abbey Limited, one of our key wood suppliers. Andrew has kindly agreed to answer our questions. Good morning. I'd like to welcome our guest this week, Andrew Bronwyn. Andrew is Managing Director of Bronwyn and Abbey Limited, a well-respected forestry management firm with offices in Powys and Worcestershire, and one of Certainly Wood's key wood suppliers. Andrew is a chartered forester and charter surveyor, and the business manages woodland throughout the UK with a focus on the traditional managed estates. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us today. Good morning, then. So in your first question, Andrew, at a time when demand for new woods and trees is, is escalating, our existing woods and trees are facing great pressure. Why is it still so important to manage woodland? It's always been important to manage wood, woodland, and that will be true in the future as well. It makes the woodlands a healthier, more resilient place, more attractive to look at, greater biodiversity, and of course, we get a timber product from it. So there's, there's no real downside to managed woods. Um, unmanaged woods uh, have proved to be uh, less attractive places. Uh, we've got quite a high proportion of unmanaged woodlands in the UK, especially broadleaf woodland. And the government, through the Forestry Commission, has in, in been encouraging the management of these woods and is still doing so. Uh, to get all these benefits that I've referred to. Okay. Uh, what's the benefit of taking wood from thinnings? Well, partly, of course, hopefully it will produce an income for the owner, which is important in that uh, a woodland that is profitable encourages an owner to manage it. Uh, but of course, we need wood in the supply chain. Uh, we need, in your instance, to uh, produce firewood. Um, in other instances, we need to produce timber for the biomass industry. We need to produce construction timber. We need to use produce sawn timber that goes into pallets and sawn fencing and, and so on. We've got a massive demand in the UK for timber products. We import uh, uh, about 80% of our timber requirements. We're the second biggest importer in the world after China. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a huge internal domestic demand for timber and timber products. And that looks like it will probably increase in the future. So if it isn't coming from our managed woods, thinning and felling and, and so on, uh, then of course we have to import it. Is there any place to encourage woodland management by the government? Um, not a huge amount. They, are, they, are, they do introduce schemes from time to time, and there's a new one that's come in in England quite recently to try and encourage uh, the management of woods by um, improving infrastructure, uh, uh, particularly. It's often lack of infrastructure that can hinder management. Um, there are grant schemes around improving biodiversity and that kind of thing in, in woodlands as well in England. Um, but the, the enthusiasm for management has ebbed and flowed a bit over the years with, with governments. And the big push at the moment with carbon as the main driver is woodland creation. Um, and that's where a lot of the public investment is going. Okay. Do you think there's enough woodland coverage to meet demands for firewood? Um, short term, yes. Long term, Possibly not. Um, so in the short term, of course, um, we have got a lot of timber coming to the market, prompted, unfortunately, by the problems with ash dieback. And we have a high percentage of ash in our lowland woods. It's a very good, it's a lovely tree. It's a very good firewood product. Um, the trees are going to have to be harvested due to the disease. Uh, that will produce... Um, a short to medium term, by which I mean probably up to five to eight years, um, maybe oversupply of timber in some instances. And after that, I can see there may be some challenges. If people have been out and about recently in woodland, they've come across 
cut down trees. Can you explain a little bit? You just mentioned about ash dying back. Can you just explain a little bit more of how bad it has been? Um, it's patchy. Uh, there's very few woods where you won't see it in some form or another. Um, uh, the disease itself is a little bit complicated, um, but because um, the fungal growth is on the leaf stalk, when the leaves drop off at the end of the, uh, the summer, as, as the tree goes into winter, the, the tree effectively de-infects itself or is de-infected. Um, but of course, um, all those fungal spores are then on the floor, on the woodland floor below, beneath the trees. And then they, they reinfect the tree again the following year. So you, the, the extent that they reinfect, it will vary according to the amount of spores, the climate conditions, and so on. Um, and we're seeing instances where we can see heavily infected and badly infected trees next to quite healthy trees. That could be for a number of reasons. It could just simply that some of the trees have got more natural health and resilience and tolerance than others. Um, there may be a higher spore percentage in one area than another area. But I think the fact of it is um, we are seeing a gradual decline in, in the ash. Uh, and the problem with it is that you then move into issues of how safe they are to fell and remove them because ash becomes quite brittle in the crown when it dies and whether it gets a secondary fungal infection in the base as the tree weakens which also might in, impact on how much timber you can recover from it and how safe it is to fell that tree. So there's a lot of factors in here that are going to impact on ash. The thinking is in the, number, the percentage of trees with some extent of tolerance might be as low as, um, as 5% or less. So it's, it's almost certain that the majority of the ash trees will succumb at some point. Yeah, it's a it's a tragic situation, isn't it? Really, it's really um, sad. The ash is a lovely, fantastic tree, and we're, by and large, I think we're going to lose it until hopefully there's some genetic breeding that takes place, which is ongoing at the moment, which will allow us to have um, trees with um, uh, some kind of resilience or tolerance uh, bred into them. Do you think that's is that sort of Five years, 10 years, or 20 years away? Or do you think it'll be like Alan and we'll not lose it forever? I would like to think within 10, but that is an absolute guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but talk, you know, talking to one or two people, they seem quite um, confident. They seem quite confident that it'll happen. Yeah. So I'd like yeah. to think within 10 years there would be something. Yeah. So ash, diabetes is obviously a disease, but, but can the wood be used for firewood? Yes, I think it's important you just don't leave it standing infected too long. I mean, there's not only the safety issues around felling, but there's also the re timber recovery issues. So, um, you know, if, if it, on, and it'll depend on soils. I think the lighter soils, the trees might um, uh, show uh, secondary fungal decay quicker. Um, so certainly the tree can be used as long as it's sound. Okay, so probably um, more more for firewood actually than than other timber sources or um, timber we, markets. So we're cutting it really into three different products. We cut it, we cut the decent part of the stem uh, into ash logs, which are predominantly going into the export market. Um, although there is there is a small internal demand as well. Um, we cut firewood for customers like certainly wood. And then the smaller end of the tree, which may not be very productive to cut into firewood because the um, diameter of the product is quite small, uh, goes into the biomass market. Okay. So the government's been very ambitious recently in their targets for planting trees, and, and they've done this in the past, haven't they? But do you think the most recent initiative will start to increase our woodland coverage? There's a big appetite to plant trees, um, uh, not, not just landowners, perhaps less, perhaps not so much landowners in some areas. There's a big external demand from uh, institutions, private investors wanting to plant trees 
people wanting to offset or inset their carbon in some way or another, people seeing it as a, another investment opportunity. Um, it depends on where you are. In England, I think the major challenge is going to be land availability. Um, but as uh, public subsidies come off agriculture and the marginal land becomes less profitable for agriculture, logically you would think that becomes more suitable for tree planting. Um, but that will obviously be quite regionally varied. Um, you know, in the more productive arable areas, I think it will be, uh, uh, there'll be less land. But I think in England, the, the, the big challenge is simply going to be finding enough land to plant to meet these ambitious government targets. Um, Scotland is, as you probably know, going uh, at a great pace for tree planting, planted 11,000 hectares last year, but a target of 15,000 in the future. Wales is a very suitable place to plant trees, but um, we've got um, issues with um, kind of government ambivalence, I think, uh, uh, and again, and again, to some extent, land availability. But I think that that might become more conducive in the in the next few years. We'll have to see, but certainly the demand to plant land is huge. Okay, and do you see tree planting leading to a tangible reduction in carbon? There's a lot of talk about it clearly, but is it having tangible benefits? It's part of it's part of the package. Um, if you're relying on tree planting to solely solve, solve for your carbon problem, it won't do it. Um, you know, we need to uh, basically we just need to use less carbon heavy. Um, materials and, and produce fewer emissions. Um, so, you know, moving to electric cars and, and that kind of thing will be part of that package. Um, agriculture can be quite uh, carbon heavy. Um, so yes, tree planting, it's probably seen a little bit too much as an easy fix, um, but there's no doubt that it, can, it, it will be part of the solution. Yeah. So the UK, I think you mentioned this earlier, still imports about 82% of its timber requirements. Do you think we'd ever become self-sufficient or more self-sufficient? No. Um, we've got the opportunity to be more, uh, use more of our own of our own supply. We haven't planted seriously for over 30 years. We're now moving into a point of, uh, to use kind of jargon, peak timber. Uh, quite shortly, within 20 to 30 years, our own internal production will fall. We haven't planted enough to meet that drop, that, that projected drop. And even if, you know, if we plant a lot of land now, that timber isn't going to be forthcoming for some years. So we, we're very reliant at the moment on the post-war plantings. Then from about 1990 till now, plantings dropped away to virtually nothing. Uh, and, it, and even if we do pick up ahead of steam now, are we still going to have a massive gap? House building is going to increase, demand for timber is going to increase, uh, the demand for in a, you know, a light, durable, carbon-friendly product like timber is, a, is going to increase. We're going to have to find it from somewhere. To a large extent, we're going to export our problem. We're going to try and find it somewhere else. But then you're up against a big global demand. America is wanting huge amounts of timber. China wants huge amounts of timber. Um, where's, where's it all going to come from? So, yeah. you know... We've got a massive potential here and a huge scope to grow more of our own resource. We've unfortunately left it a bit late. Yeah. So where do you think that sea leaves sort of timber prices over the coming years? So? Logically, you would think going up. Um, so I think it'll, it'll vary a lot from the product, won't you? But for sawn timber, you'd expect those to be quite buoyant. I mean, there's always going to be, you know, it's a commodity, so there's always going to be um, 
uh, dips and, uh, and peaks in the market. That's how commodities work. But you would expect prices. And I think there's a lot of rebalancing of prices are over many years of the prices being quite low to increase. So I think that will happen. It is quite simple supply and demand economics. Yeah. So can you explain a little bit, Andrew, about the um, UK Woodland Assurance Scheme and, and what they do? Um, so that's a, uh, a sustainability um, scheme um, to prove, to demonstrate that you're managing your woods in a, in a sustainable way. So that's to do with uh, economics, um, biodiversity, uh, and, and the social element of, of management. And if you bring your woods up into um, AQUOS certification, um, you have to manage those woods against a standard, and that standard is audited on an annual basis um, by a third party auditor. Um, during that audit, you'll have to show that um, you haven't taken out more timber, for example, than the woods can sustainably produce, um, that you've um, properly looked after and enhanced your uh, biodiversity within the wood, um, that you've um, looked after your uh, contractors properly in terms of health and safety and so on, and that for users of the wood, um, that they've got the opportunities to, you know, recreational users, for example, that they've got the opportunities to use the woods in a, in a, in a safe manner. So it's a whole range of things that you're being audited against. Um, and it's a way of proving uh, um, objectively, if you like, uh, that you're managing your woods in a sustainable manner. Okay, which certainly for us as a business is, is reassuring because, you know, we're 100% British. So it, it's um, nice for our customers to know that there's that sort of, um, you know, control in place. but. As always, many people are always worried about deforestation around the world. And so what, what have we got in place in the UK to prevent this happening? Um, whenever you fell trees, I'm talking about felling now rather than simply thinning, i.e. you've cleared a patch of woodland, um, there's always a legal obligation to restock it. Um, so uh, we operate, if you're not operating under the UK Woodland Assurance Scheme, UCWAS, you have to, as an absolute minimum, operate under the UK Forest Standard. And that's a, that's a similar standard to UCWAS, but possibly slightly less onerous um, or demanding. Um, but as part of that, you've always got to replant your woodland. So um, deforestation and returning land to agriculture or another land use um, by and large can't happen. That's not to say there aren't elements, there are instances where you see um, forests felled and windmills built, for example, or some development that goes on. But if that's the case, there's always got to be replacement planting somewhere else. So we should be um, increasing our forest cover as a percentage uh, of the total land use in, in, in the future years with this, um, A, this policy of having always to restock and be more woodland creation. Okay. And, and finally then, so being an island, we're restricted in our land availability, as you mentioned earlier, but what's in place to ensure there's a harmonious relationship between agriculture and forestry? Um, well, I'd say it hasn't been particularly harmonious if, uh, uh, over the years, and I think um, there's lots of reasons for that. But um, I suppose forestry to date, up until recently, has been rather the poor, poor cousin in terms of rural land use. Agriculture has been quite dominant. It's had a lot of public money thrown at it. Um, and there's a lot of emphasis being on agriculture. It's got a, it's got a strong lobby through the National Farmers Union and and so on, um, and, uh, but I think that's possibly being rebalanced a little bit now, and uh, the government's got an opportunity through its new grant schemes, uh, how it chooses to spend public money uh, and which industry it, you know, it wants to encourage, 
Um, and so hopefully forestry will, will receive a bit more, forestry and woodland management will re receive a bit more of its fair share. I mean, for example, in Wales, I don't think it's massively different in England. Um, you know, out of the 100%, uh, if you like, of public money going into agriculture in Wales, 2% um, has gone into forestry and 98% has gone into agriculture, even though woodland is 13% of the land use area. So you would think by definition, we should get 13% and we've got 2%. Um, uh, and you know, the farmers are obviously pretty keen to hang on to um, whatever money they can, they can get. So, you know, there is a struggle, if you like, between the various factions to, to get their fair share of, of the action. Uh, but I, I, I think there will be a bit more rebalancing in the future. Yeah. Okay, so you're obviously, you're a bit more bullish then, perhaps, about forestry moving forward? Well, it's an interesting thing, really. I mean, you know, in my 30, 35 years of working in the industry, it's, we've always been seen as, as I say, rather the poor cousin and, you know, farmers particularly or institutional investors or even, even woodland owners often have said, why bother to manage your woods? You know, why bother to plant trees? Why there's no money in it? Why are we doing it? That has all changed now. And, you know, we've become much more uh, popular, much more flavor of the month. Um, and that's going to bring with it its own challenges of can we can we meet that demand? You know, can we find enough land to plant? Um, can can we produce enough timber to keep our industries going if, if house building moves more to timber, that kind of thing? Um, so there are some challenges there, but certainly, um, you know, I've, I've I've never seen the level of interest as much as it is now. It's huge, which is lovely. You know, that's all great for the industry going forward, but. Um, we need we need to be able to meet those challenges i think as an industry yeah exactly um andrew thank you very much for your time today it's um it's very much appreciated and um thanks for joining us no pleasure nick good to see you thanks for watching if you want to find out more about certainly wood just click on the website link below